Thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks very much to all of you for inviting us here today to speak about the future of hip-hop studies. Uh, uh, and thank you to Rafa, who, you know, Chuck D was here last year. Was it last year that we had Chuck? And, uh, and I think that's what he meant when he said he doesn't rhyme for the sake of Ritalin. So um, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's an honor to be here because um, it's kind of a second home now. I'm here every year. Um, and so some of you, some of you have been uh, hearing some of these points, me making these points for a while, but I'm going to make them again. And I'm going to do it in a, hopefully a, li a little bit of a different way uh, than Mark did. He's given you a really breathtaking intellectual history here of hip-hop studies. Um, and I want to try to do a couple of things, which is to sort of make the case for hip-hop studies um, and to talk about what hip-hop studies agendas could be in the future um, and what we can expect five, ten years down the line. That's a, a question that came up at lunch. The university's role in society is to build and disseminate bodies of knowledge, right? Um, for our survival and development as individuals, um, as communities, as society, as humanity. So the first point I got to make is about the importance of bodies of knowledge that hip-hop has created um, and how much uh, it matters to us, how important it is to us. We talk about the formation of hip-hop studies and scholarship and knowledge, and the truth is, um, is that uh, it's not recent, right? Hip-hop studies and hip-hop knowledge started from the very beginning of the movement. So as Mark was talking about, there were journalists like David Toop, like Gray Tate, uh, like Stephen Hager, like Nelson George, um, Michael Holman, folks like that who were covering the movement, who were trying to document that this wasn't just a fad at the time. And we have pioneers in the academy like Trisha Rose and Mark, who were from the Bronx and they were fighting doubters and haters at every step of the way to make sure that people understood that this was important knowledge that needed to be gotten out there. But if we're going to be real, we should talk about hip-hop knowledge and scholarship beginning from the beginning. So let's recognize that what Africa Bambata and Grand Wizard Theodore and Charlie Chase and Disco Wiz, what they were doing when they were loading up their crates, right, and refining their techniques was creating a body of knowledge. What b-boys and b-girls were doing in bringing movements from across the diaspora, that was building a body of knowledge. What graph writers were doing in creating styles and methods to advance those new styles was creating a body of knowledge. What the Herculoids and the Furious Five and the Cold Crush Brothers were doing when they were writing rhymes, when they were drawing from oral histories um, and oral traditions and chants and melodies was building a body of knowledge. It didn't become knowledge because the universities recognized it. It became knowledge as soon as, as it was born. And these are knowledges that have moved millions. And new forms of knowledge have been built upon them. So you can talk about the application or the approaches to technology that hip hop has. How Flash, Grandmaster Flash, approaches a turntable and how that's now transformed the way that people think not just about music, but about sound. Uh, you can talk about insights into the display of art, right? Phase two, thinking about a subway car and how that's changed the way we understand art in the public, in the public sphere. Um, during a period in which privatization of space has been increasingly an issue. There's a lot more, though, there. ta Coates is a writer for The Atlantic. Um, he's one of my favorite writers out there. And he talks about how hip-hop has changed the way that he thinks. It, in fact, it taught him how to think. And he doesn't mean only in terms of his own aesthetic of writing, but the very formation of himself, his self, in relation to time and space. So used in the right way, hip-hop is really a pedagogy of the oppressed for now. There's now countless after-school programs for elementary schools, high schools, middle schools, all around the country. Um, in 2005, the hip-hop archive was counting 300 courses across the U.S. at the college level. I'd say that there's probably triple that by now. Uh, Howard University is going to be offering a hip-hop studies minor. Here we've got the first wave uh, program. Cornell University started up a hip-hop collection where they've got stuff, artifacts, photos, ephemera from the Bronx um, documenting the birth of hip-hop, the very birth of hip-hop in the Bronx. So we're entering into a period in which interest in hip-hop studies at the university level is going to be begin to really accelerate. But we should also note that the governments of Cuba and Brazil 
are funding hip-hop pedagogical projects, right? Because they understand uh, that it's important to their national cultural policy. And so to us, that makes perfect sense, because hip-hop is one of the most important movements of our generation. It's in every way as historically important as any American social movement, cultural movement, arts movement that's come along, um, because it saved lives. And when we talk about the young people of the Bronx who first came to create the culture, right, the, the Bambadas, the Hercs, the Flashes, uh, and the women who don't get spoken of, right, Lisa Lee and Zulu Nation, uh, the Zulu Queens, Shah Rock, Pebbly Poo, and of course Cindy Campbell, Cool Herc's sister. Right? When we talk about them, they were creating this uh, with just a small number of people. It was like maybe 200 people at the first party, if that. That could be exaggerating a little bit. And they did this in terms of uh, uh, the conditions, amongst, amidst the conditions of struggle, of the politics of abandonment and the politics of containment. So hip hop's a testament to young people's creativity. And when that creativity brought success at these goals, it moved on to kind of take up the mantle of the civil rights movement. Hip hop culturally desegregated America. I don't think you can imagine Barack Obama's candidacy and victory without hip hop. Because it so thoroughly expanded our imaginations uh, that it made all things seem possible, not just a new aesthetics, but a new politics. So let's take hip hop's aesthetic influence first. The hip hop arts movement has left its mark on theater, on poetry, on literature, journalism, criticism, performance art, dance, visual arts, photography, graphic design, painting, video, you name it. Um, we can talk about the impact of the spoken word movement, right, right here with First Wave, on the, appreciating, uh, the appreciation and the continuing evolution of American poetry. We can talk about the rise of hip-hop influenced literature, with folks like Juno Diaz, Adam Mansbach, Zadie Smith. We can talk about how hip-hop has re-energized theater uh, through artists like Sarah Jones, Danny Hawk, through Mark Bamuthi Joseph and others. We can talk about the role choreographers like Rennie Harris uh, or F uh, Fatima Robinson have played um, in transforming dance and movement. We can talk about visual artists um, and the visual arts. Folks like Kahinde Wiley, Julie Moretu, Nadine Robinson, Sanford Biggers, Say Adams, B+, and how they're creating a new visual language in an era that's saturated um, with images. So understanding hip hop's essential for anyone concerned in the arts and the humanities. Now these artistic breakthroughs happen within social contexts, right? And that's a point that I was trying to make in Can't Stop, Won't Stop. Hip hop didn't start as a political movement. It wasn't heralded by a manifesto. Uh, it started as a way for kids to have a good time. But it has long since come to inhabit its time to become one of the big generational ideas around the globe. So hip hop now supports deep social inquiry and can yield fresh insights uh, into interesting questions. Think about these questions. What can the rise of specific social dances, right? Jerkin, think about jerkin or crumpin, right? What can these dances tell us about what's happening with urban migration, with economic shifts and dislocations, with housing policies, uh, with housing development? Why do we have groups, uh, hip hop dance groups coming out of Naperville, Illinois? <laughs> Why are hip hop music producers coming out of decaying suburbs like Fairfield or Vacaville? which are pretty much in the nowhere between Sacramento and the Bay Area. And these questions, if you start thinking about them, right, they lead us back to some of the major questions that, that folks are trying to think about at this particular moment in history. What's the geography of creativity and innovation? What are the microeconomics of sustainable communities? What role has the desegregation of culture played in social and political change amidst resegregation? Now there's one more argument worth considering here, and that's the historical significance of this movement. So I can tell you a little story about last October. We were at the Cornell University um, Library to sort of inaugurate this hip hop collection. And the librarians at one point decided to take the pioneers um, and a couple of lucky stragglers along like me <laughs> down into the basement, right, into their real archives. 
Um, and now there's a lot of folks in hip hop that would say, well, if hip hop gets into the university, that's the point at which you really know it's going to be dead. You got the cold shoulder of, uh, the cold hand of death on your shoulder. And so, you know, we're sitting here in, in, in the basement, right? It's refrigerated, um, climate controlled and that kind of thing. And this would have been one of those moments for those folks to be really cynical like that. But, you know, you're watching African Bambada and Grand Wizard Theater and Grandmaster Kaz holding up the Gettysburg Address, taking pictures of that, you know. They're holding up copies of the 14th Amendment. And, and I think that if, if, if folks thought of it in that way, uh, you can see that this is something that, that it, it, we belong there. Hip-hop belongs there. Hip-hop has been one of those things that uh, folks said shouldn't belong anywhere, right? It shouldn't be in the streets. They banned breaking, right? It shouldn't be on the trains. They got rid of it on the trains. Um, some folks said it shouldn't be in the university. Mark, Trish, and a lot of other folks said, no, it should be. Um, and so there we were. Hip-hop's vitality comes, of course, from the communities, from young people in the communities. Um, but just because it's in the university doesn't mean that it's dead. <laughs> um, it means that it's made history and that we need to know that history. Another way to talk about the value of hip-hop studies is to talk about what it means uh, at this particular moment, this particular global post-multicultural moment. Now, between the election of Richard Nixon, right, who in 1968, along with George Wallace, secured 57% of the vote, the popular vote, on a platform of racial backlash and backlash against young people, to the election of Barack Obama, a lot has changed, right? Hip-hop has a large part uh, to, to say, a, large thing to, a lot of things to say about that particular change. We're still in an era in which paradigms, especially around race and gender and sexuality, are changing very, very quickly. During the 1980s, there was the multicultural movement. And it turned campuses into front lines on the cultural wars. And we saw this play out in everything from whether there should be graduation requirements around cross-cultural studies uh, to questions of admissions and affirmative action and diversity. But many of these ideas around representation and inequality that animated those particular debates, they're obsolete now. They don't make any sense anymore. Hip-hop kind of emerged in that breach. And in some ways, it extended the agendas of multiculturalism. And in some ways, it, it refuted them. It reacted against them. So what is true is that we need new modes to be able to understand the new questions that are arising. How do we track the global dialogues that are occurring now in aesthetics and politics? What do they mean for identity, for activism? What does it mean, again, that even as American popular culture has become so culturally desegregated, that the nation is experiencing resegregation in its schools, in its cities, um, in its neighborhoods, um, I'd submit actually that the intensity of this debate um, can yield a lot of sort of insights into generational change, uh, the nature of commodity culture, the direction of political movements, not to mention layers of class, race, gender, and sexuality. There's a second question, um, and this one's a little bit more difficult. It's been articulated by the queer Latino playwright uh, Jorge Ignacio Cortinas, and he wrote in an important piece in American theater in 2004, um, and he calls himself a multiculturalist, he asked whether the notion of hip-hop theater might, quote, end segregation in our theatrical bureaucracies and serve as a Trojan horse that smuggled us into, uh, smuggles us into the long pine for multicultural future. He wrote, quote, in fact, available evidence suggests that hip-hop won't do this, shouldn't have to, and can't. Hip-hop, he said, was merely becoming quote, a placeholder for race in the North American stage, the box in which to toss and be done with all the exhausting pluralism of our polyglot cities, the latest orthodoxy that artists of color are expected to conform to. Now, this objection, which I don't think has been dealt with as much in hip-hop studies, um, is serious. And I think it requires that we go back to the multiculturalism movement. Uh, it's one of those histories that's maligned, that nobody wants to talk about. It's almost as if nothing happened between the 60s and the 90s. Um, it's erased even from alternative histories. But Cortinas reminds us that although hip-hop's a powerful mode through which to approach the questions of the post-multicultural condition, 
It's not the only one. And the last question to address um, is where hip hop studies lands institutionally. It's a, it's a question that never confronted jazz studies at all. Um, jazz studies was largely relegated to music, dance, and performance studies. Um, it emerged in an era before interdisciplinary studies was, was widely accepted. And it came before the arrival of cohorts of, of scholars of color through affirmative action and diversity programs. And certainly, the intellectual agenda of hip-hop studies is a lot broader than jazz studies ever was. We know that hip-hop studies courses have been and are currently be ta being taught in English, in comparative lit, in sociology, in history, in music, in dance, in media studies, in art, in performance studies, not to mention women's studies, Asian American studies, Chicano Latino studies, ethnic studies, you can go on and on and on. Um, some folks see hip-hop studies as a continuing project of, of African American and Afro diasporic studies. Others might contend that hip-hop studies demands departmental am uh, ambitions. One could also imagine claims being made for hip-hop studies to be housed in other fields or alternatively to be contained in independent research centers. And I think that this question is going to continue to gain an urgency as hip-hop studies makes its way deeper into the academy. Let me move to the question of future hip-hop studies agendas. Uh, I think we need to conform, uh, uh, sort of confront two important issues. The first is the commodification of hip-hop, and the second is the new emerging culture war. First, let's talk about the commodification of hip-hop, because the official history of hip-hop is one that's largely been dictated by commerce. What we know the most about is what commerce is interested in. What we know the least about is what commerce isn't interested in. And I think that in some ways, I shouldn't be equivocal about this at all. I think in some ways this reflects a failure of imagination on some of our parts to imagine hip hop studies as vital beyond the marketplace in the same way that the hip hop movement is. Some of it might be a capitulation to institutional pressures. Some of it might reflect a position that that which needs to be studied is that which is reaching the most amount of people. And some of this might be lazy scholarship. But students come uh, to be given the tools to understand the world, right? So a lot of folks might start taking hip-hop studies because they figure, oh, great, we can talk about who's hotter, Kid Cudi or Drake, right? And that's not to say that that, yeah, okay, see, you already are starting. That's not to say that that debate doesn't have, like, pedagogical, you know, importance or implications, but there are much bigger questions to address that hip-hop studies should get to. As a 12-year-old in Honolulu, the first rap record I loved was Rapper's Delight. Right? And up until recently, most of the accounts uh, of hip-hop just started with rap and started with this one record, Rapper's Delight. But now, we know that that story is a story of betrayal because most of those rhymes are stolen from Grandmaster Kaz. And now because commercial rap is dying, right? we're talking about rap sales dropping off about 60 to 70% over the last nine years. Because rap's dying, commercial rap's dying, a lot of folks are saying hip-hop's dead. This is the view of hip-hop through the eyes of capital. Much of hip-hop studies is focused on the hip-hop that's product, that's for sale, uh, and the knowledge that's for sale through global media monopolies. But what about, for instance, histories of hip-hop dance that are so meticulously documented and they're, they're taught person to person uh, throughout the world in the old way? What about the reality that the way that most people experience hip-hop still is locally? Wherever young people are gathering uh, to invent new dances, create new slang, Bay Area slang, you know. <laughs> hip-hop's still a neighborhood movement. So while it seems like it's often been reduced to the sum of its total revenues, right, a fact that can lead us to think a lot about its end, uh, despair of its future, we know that hip-hop thrives as a national and global network of local movements. So parts of hip-hop are dying. Commercial rap, no doubt, is dying, despite the best, best efforts of Jay-Z and Lil Wayne. But the body doesn't die as long as the cells continue to reproduce. So our work is now to be critical about the bodies of knowledge that have been privileged. Um, the, the bodies of knowledge that privilege what is sold and to recover the bodies of knowledge that are refused to be sold. It's to listen closely to the silenced voices, 
the voices silenced by capitalism and the other isms that still affect us, sexism, homophobia, racism, and then to turn up the volume so everyone else can hear. The other point I want to make is about hip hop studies at this particular moment when it seems that we're beginning to experience a new cultural war. The culture wars of the 60s and the 70s pitted uh, Nixon's silent majority against invisible silence minorities. Culture wars of the 80s and the 90s pitted cultural gatekeepers against organized communities of color demanding representation. The new culture wars take place against the backdrop of the emergence of a new political and cultural majority. It's the same majority that made hip hop mainstream and the same majority that made Obama president. In the past week, just the past week, two hip hop activists in the Obama administration have been silenced. Van Jones, the Green Job Czar, and Yossi Sargent, who is a communications director at the National Endowment for the Arts. Now, green movements, arts advocacy, academic research, they don't take place in a vacuum. In the wake of Obama's victory, what's been going on is that the right's been taking these old fears, right, about youth, about race, about leftism, to go hard after the progressives whose work engages grassroots movements, like the hip-hop activist movement, like the hip-hop arts movement, and reaches people in communities directly through media and through the arts. They understand, demagogues like Glenn Beck understand the role that culture has played in creating the colorized world that we live in now and they're trying to stop it in its tracks. So please understand that when you're practicing hip hop studies, right, the work of building and spreading these bodies of knowledge, it has real world consequences. It can change the world and it can also fire up the forces who are against change, who fear change. Let me close with some notes from my personal experience for those of you who are working in hip hop studies, um, those of you who are just getting started, those of you who should be here standing in my shoes. I've come to understand that every single piece I've ever written, uh, it's not mine alone, it's the work of the community. My name might be on the byline, but it can only come out of the generosity and goodwill of the community itself. That was certainly the case with Can't Stop, Won't Stop. Uh, I came to hip hop from literally half a world away. I came at, uh, came at it from, from an island in the middle of the Pacific. Um, and I was just an eager student when I first began writing about hip-hop in the early 90s. But in my process, my community, whose individuals who are, are, are both living and who have passed on, uh, I can now count them into the thousands. They took me by the hand. So people like Africa Bambata, Lucky Strike, and Rita Fetcher, Richie Perez, uh, Fabo and Christy Pabon, Benjamin Melendez, and Carlos Suarez. Uh, the list just goes on and on. They opened their doors. They open their archives, they open their minds. The point I'm trying to make is this. The deeper that you go, the more crucial every detail becomes. And the deeper that you go, the more responsibility that you feel. When you begin to engage in serious hip hop scholarship, it's not just an intellectual exercise, it's not just about getting music or free swag. Uh, it might start that way, but it's not gonna last that way for very long. It's not about you, right? It moves beyond that. You're just a conduit. You're just a vessel. And you, eventually you learn this or you fail. It's a process of recognition. It's about recognizing that these are stories of lives that have been lived, that are being lived, and that must be deeply respective. And at the end of the day, these are stories that are not trivial. They're central to our national identity and they're central to who we are and who are becoming as a generation globally. So I want to ask all of you who remain eager students of hip hop to be aware of uh, and approach your work with a sense of this importance. The charge that we have is to hold our part to carry forward the stories that have been half told or never been told. This past weekend on the front page of the New York Times, uh, there was a really sad story. It's about one of the pioneers of hip hop, uh, a man named Leon Hayward, he went by the name MC Sundance. Now, Leon Hayward was born in the early 60s. He came up in the Bronx during a period in which the gangs uh, were beginning to, to kind of sunset, to fade. Um, and because he had to get the gab, 
he became an MC. Right? He took the name MC Sundance, started working for Disco King Mario, who was a black spade, um, who was one of the main influences on Africa Bambata getting started in DJing. Um, and he started to build a reputation. He became one of the first b-boys. He was in the Zulu Kings, which became um, sort of the dance crew of Zulu Nation. And by the time he reached his 20s, he was emceeing with the Jazzy Five, which is a group that, that DJ Jazzy J uh, in the Bronx had. Um, but he did one of those things that a lot of folks do in, in the arts. You know, he, he decided that he'd go solo just before the Jazzy Five cut a hit record called Jazzy Sensation. Right? Clap your hands and do the gigolo, gigolo, clap your hands. Mark remembers that one. You know, so his story might have been forgotten there. But the New York Times picked it up on September 11th, 2001. By now, here was a strong fit man working at the uh, Department of Consumer Affairs over at 42 Broadway near the World Trade Center. And, uh, and that morning, as he came out of the subway, the second plane hit the South Tower. But instead of running uh, away from the situation, he ran directly to the building uh, where all of his coworkers were and he helped evacuate all the disabled employees that were in the building. Um, at one point while he was evacuating people, the first tower collapsed, and he was engulfed in a toxic cloud. So this is how the Times reporter Lisa Fotoraro describes what happened next. Within months, he started to feel sick. A father of two who prided himself on being fit, Mr. Hayward found himself overcome with fatigue. He had seizures, his memory slipped, once, while working undercover as an inspector, he forgot where he was. He contracted lymphoma cancer, and he died last October. So last Friday, his name was read at ground zero. He was the 2,742nd uh, victim of the World Trade Center attacks. And were it not for this last tragic fact, the New York Times most likely would not have told the story of MC Sundance. What kinds of knowledge died with MC Sundance? What might have he have taught us about his neighborhood, about his city, about the methods and meanings of sacrifice and community and survival? How many millions of more stories are there, like Leon Hayward's? What don't we yet know about what kinds of knowledge are out there in the global hip-hop community? Hip-hop is about the half of the story that's never been told. So hip-hop studies should be no different. It's not merely about eliminating the gaps between high culture and low culture, between boomers and post-boomers between the community and the academy. It's not just about fostering education that's relevant to us, to the present, right? It's not just about upholding radical diversity in the face of economic and political pressures towards monoculturalism. In the end, telling the half that hasn't been told gives us the crucial knowledge to begin building healthy, sustainable, and creative communities locally and globally. That's the promise of hip-hop studies. Thanks very much for your time. On behalf of me and Mark, let's sit there and I have a question about um, hip hop as being one of the predominant faces of American culture on the global scale. And um, as an example, I know uh, distinguished professor Peggy Choi had a hand in bringing Tiny Tunes here last year, which is a uh, Cambodian-based uh, breakdance team who you may have heard of. They were featured in the New York Times. But <clears throat> I was wondering if you, you two could just maybe comment on the B-Boy as possibly being some kind of uh, new global identity, so it's kind of, or, or, and, and what kind of implications that, that would have on something like cultural imperialism or, or some new transnational emergent identity that might be coming about. Thanks. Mark Perry, who's a scholarly, uh, a scholar at Compton at the University of Illinois in Urbana, um, and has a wonderful book on Cuban hip hop that's coming out later this year. He describes, you know, hip hop style, hip hop masculinity, beat boys, if you will, as the lingua franca of global youth. Uh, and I think he's dead on with that, right? I mean, just simply the entering of, of the look or the sound of it you know, becomes a language that folks are able to articulate with each other, communicate with each other. Um, it, very much the way Michael Jackson might have functioned in the mid-1980s. Uh, I, I think hip-hop 
plays that same function, you know, in 2009 in the global context. One of the things that um, I was really blessed to have an opportunity to do last year was to um, uh, go to South Korea uh, to witness the R16 competition, which is one of the big uh, b-boy competitions around the world. And, um, you know, the thing about it is that with the b-boys and b-girls, and it's really important to highlight the b-girls as well, um, but what they've been able to do is create these um, transnational global communities. I mean, Jerry is here last year bringing out crews from Hong Kong. Um, it's, it's, it was powerful, it was amazing. At R16, it was the first you know, team competing there for the PRC um, ever in history. And they're all wide eyed. They're like, wow, you know, in about five years or six years, they'll probably be winning everything. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a fascinating type of thing because what you saw happening, um, not just on stage, but sort of, you know, off stage in the hotel lobbies, all this kind of stuff with this um, amazing sort of intercultural dialogue that's kind of going on. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of things got uh, blew my wig back. One of the things that blew my wig back was that it wasn't the first world countries, the global north countries, um, that you expect that have the most diverse. Um, crews. The most diverse crew was actually from Holland. Um, African, Asian, biracial Asian, um, Dutch, you know, um, as well as Dutch, as well as Swedish, um, Arab, all kinds of folks on that, on that team, much more diverse than the, than the U.S. team, you know. Um, and, and, uh, and, and the fact that folks can kind of immerse themselves in this language as craft, um, it was was actually very very telling. The other thing that I wanted to say too is it opens up a whole discussion as well about cultural policy, um, relative cultural policy in these different countries. South Korea put two million dollars into that competition last year. They probably put more this year. Uh, maybe they put less because Korea was has been really hit hard with the recession. Um, but they put that much. They were able to. Uh, help the stations there broadcast into like 50 countries. Um, and, you know, the, the American groups, it was Super Crew actually, that was there representing the U.S. last year, um, who went on one in D.C. Uh, you know, they have, they have to go in and raise their money through competitions, through um, commercial stuff. And, you know, it's, it's a whole different type of ball game there. Um, so, for me, it came it, it came down to this thing of like, I need to come back and talk about cultural policy in the U.S. Um, in a weird way, hip hop opened up that whole discussion um, that brought us to the White House earlier this year to talk with folks like Yossi Sargent. Yossi Sargent brought himself to the White House because of the campaign that he did with uh, Shepard Ferry using street art, you know, the Obama Pope campaign. So um, that I think is is, is powerful. It's going to continue to 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 be really important. Could you uh, clarify your like? Because you spoke on the um, the commodification of hip hop, and I was wondering if if you were speaking about it in a in a light way or in 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 a, in a negative in a negative light. Because I felt like uh, it was definitely taking the third person, but I was wondering what uh, your personal opinions are on the commodification of hip hop. I mean, let me be clear. <coughs> I don't have a problem with thinking of art as a commodity. I, I think artists should be able to make a living off of their art. Um, I think what becomes an issue is when the concerns of art as commodity outweigh the integrity of art as art. And at least in the context of, of hip hop, you know, it, it's clear that the way that corporate culture has decided to deal with art that ultimately everything is the bottom line to how quickly can they produce and reproduce and distribute commodity. Art becomes very a little part of it. Um, you know, if you want to think about where what the music industry, for instance, think about hip hop in 2009, their primary concern is what's your phone sell? You know, artists make records in 2009 with the hope that their song will become a hot ringtone. 
The only reason why T Pain is in the room is because he sold like 60 million of them. Um, you know, so when it gets to that point, you, you realize that art's no longer on the table anymore. And I think some of us, you know, this is not a, a, a new concern. And some of us, this has been a concern since Puppy walked in the room. Um, for lots of reasons, right? Including the fact he didn't have any talent. Um, I, I guess that was harsh. Um, you want to add to the party thing? No, to the commodity thing. Okay. I don't know. I thought it was pretty clear. Um, you know, I, I feel like I feel like you know, commerce has distorted the way that we look at hip hop studies, man. It's like, bottom line, like we're not sitting here um, talking about the graffiti movement as much as we're talking about commercial rap all the time. And I think that it goes it goes so much deeper. I mean, there's a whole there's a whole thing to uncover here. Uh, there's the the sort of unwritten story that's still out there um, is is a um, how did hip hop open up all these new avenues for folks to understand and see race? Okay. Um, B how then did it get co-opted um, into a lot of a myriad of different types of commercial ways? What was our complicity? I was a I was a record label head, an independent record label head. I was a, a mogul. <laughs> I wasn't a biggie. Um, I think I paid like a thousand dollars in in taxes that year or something like that or less. But um, but you know I you know we all thought hey you know we can bum rush the system and we can get our word out that way right? And I think that in a lot of ways um, what happened was the culture industry pivoted on hip hop, right? It moved from, I mean, y'all will never remember this, but when I was growing up, not to date myself, but you just didn't see folks of color, even in Hawaii, on TV. I grew up in Hawaii, you know what I'm saying? Who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> you heard it from his parents. Um, and, 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 and after hip hop, it was completely different, you know what I'm saying? The culture industry pivoted on that. It made the American culture industry possible to move to a global um, type of market, hip hop did, right? And so there's a lot of stuff happening in that. Um, and the major thing that we missed during that particular period was media consolidation, right? And and those of you, um, so I'm really sorry, because those of you who have seen me here every year, I talk about this every year, but this story kind of needs to be told. How many of you know what the 1996 Telecommunications Act was? Okay. All of you that have been around and, and uh, so that was the turning point for hip hop. It was a huge turning point for hip hop because after that, what you had was um, media monopolies. You had Clear Channel going from 120 radio stations to 1,200. Um, you had all these companies being bought up. We went from six major labels to four within the course of a few years. Uh, we could still be going down to three. You know what I mean? Um, ownership was concentrated, right? And these are the agendas that folks like Glenn Beck are, are trying to preserve. The next person that Glenn Beck is going to go after is Mark Lloyd, who, what is he? He's the uh, Associate Director for Diversity in the FCC. So, you know, that, I mean, I think it's, it's really deep. It's really deep and it's really serious. And I think that, that that's why hip hop studies has to kind of knuckle up. It has to get on after what's happened um, in the marketplace to culture. Um, it's not just about celebrating the art that we love. It's not just about arguing Drake or Cuddy. You know what I mean? It's not just about you know Wayne and Jay Z. You know, it's not just about even Julie Moretu or Red Cook. You know, it's it's about getting at some of these fundamental questions that have dictated what our existence um, looks like right now at Madison on September 14th, 2009. So uh, you touched on how um, graffiti and street art is a way of attacking the, contra the contraption that confines you. Um, I was wondering, where does someone like uh, Banksy stand in terms of uh, making those political statements more explicit and literally attacking the system like what he did at Disneyland and um, what he's been doing around the world on a global scale? A lot of, a lot of folks in hip-hop, and, and I'm not one of them, I kind of came in as a political activist. Uh, you know, at the same time that I was a DJ. But a lot of folks in hip-hop, um, as they've gotten older, have moved from being 
sort of, you know, having anarchic tendencies, right? To um, having, a, you know, he used to go and paint wild style on cows in the meadow, right? Um, I felt that for those cows, but they're getting slaughtered anyway, I guess. Um, anyway, he, you know, he went from doing that kind of stuff to, to doing really interesting interventions um, in very strategic places around the world. He was able to use the money he was making, the ridiculous sums of money that he was making, off of a lot of the art work that he was doing, um, and use those in really interesting interventions. Um, I don't know if you saw the Katrina, or the post-Katrina New Orleans murals that he did, or some of the work that he did in Jamaica, um, you know, around policing and poverty. Um, you know, all of that stuff is extremely political, and all of that stuff forces um, not just the viewers that are there physically in that space, but people that then see that stuff on the web to be like, okay, what's he really about here? You know, in some ways he's he's uh, done a great thing, you know, which is what we want culture to do, which is he's made resistance really cool um, and made being smart, um, you know, something to try to achieve. That's what hip hop did for us in a lot of respects, and I think that that's what Banksy is carrying on. Jeff, you had used the um, example of Jay Z and P Diddy kind of um, oppressing now that they're um, they've kind of mated, and I was wondering what the two of you thought, um, what hip hop as a movement, what other oppressions it has kind of created for itself, and what kind of holes it might have gotten itself into just as it has progressed, and um, and how can it start digging itself out of those holes, especially if hip hop is um, a pedagogy of the oppressed. This is, this is Mark's favorite. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. It sure is. <laughs> you know, I'm conflicted between giving hip hop a lot of credit and not giving hip hop too much credit. Um, you know, this comes down for me around the question, for instance, about hip hop and mis misogyny and sexism. Um, if, if we were to follow the narrative and homophobia, as, 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 homophobia as, it's been, as it's been bandied about, we would think that somehow sexism, misogyny, and homophobia wouldn't exist if hip hop didn't exist. Um, you know, Gwen Pugh, you know, in, in her book, you know, talks about, you know, hip-hop really does the grunt work for patriarchy in the United States. So I think if, if there's a thing to say about what hip-hop has done for us is that hip-hop has made explicit these politics. And in some cases, the only time we ever talk about these politics is because hip-hop brought us to that conversation. Um, when you think about the response uh, to the Spellman protest, the tip drill, and Nelly, when you think about our conversation about Don Imus and shock jocks in general two years ago with his comments, um, if you think about the conversations we had earlier this year around domestic abuse and Chris Brown and Rihanna, um, there's an argument to be said that we are not having these national conversations with the people that we had these not national conversations with if hip hop is not in the room. You know, but the other side of that is that, you know, when, you, when we actually did have these conversations and we're seeing debates, and, and there have been so many studies about folks who took, you know, Kriana into the classroom, you know, elementary school classrooms and having eight, nine, ten-year-old kids talk about, well, of course he should have hit her, right? You know, that's what my dad does to my mom. And again, you know, is this because hip-hop is so pervasive that it becomes this politics of abuse? Or does hip hop just really make explicit and reinforce a politics of abuse that already exists in our society? Um, in that regard, I think hip hop creates a community for us to interrogate these issues that wouldn't <coughs> exist if hip hop didn't exist, right? So, you know, it's, it's the good and the bad in that regard. Where do you see hip hop studies in American public schools? What is the future for it there? Is there a place for it there? Would it be accepted? And I don't know, is there any educational material being developed? We talked about hip hop as a cottage industry early. Um, you know, we don't have to imagine what the future of hip hop is going to be in public schools because it's, it's already there. You know, the work of someone like David Stovall, uh, University of Illinois, Chicago in terms of bringing hip-hop pedagogy into social studies classrooms, you know, and the Chicago public school system. I can think about the work of someone like Kawachi Clemens, who is one of the founders of the hip-hop initiative in North Carolina Central, um, in North Carolina, who literally created, um, you know, a pedagogy, a curriculum 
uh, around hip hop and literature and using hip hop to teach Shakespeare and a range of things. They've been doing some groundbreaking work in the city of New Orleans around this. I mean, there, there's so many examples of teachers on the ground understanding that they had lost their capacity to reach the children in their classroom. And if they wanted to find a reach, the way to reach them, they had to find the things that reached the kids. Um, so they had to take, you know, hip hop culture in this regard at face value. And again, it wasn't about just using clever rhymes and beats, you know, to help teach math. Um, but as, you know, Jeff and I have been talking about all day, you know, to think about hip hop as a worldview, as a way to approach problem solving, um, as a way to approach mediation, right, as a way to approach the archiving and distribution of knowledge. Um, you know, there are folks who have been doing some really fantastic work around that. Um, and it, it really is just a question of, as is the case in most, any place where we're talking about groundbreaking and cutting edge curriculum, you know, making sure that there's a funding stream there to continue the kind of innovative work that's already occurred. Um, you guys both spoke about um, just the disrespect of hip hop and people who disregard and really don't believe in hip hop. And it's almost 30, 35 years later and people still have yet to acknowledge hip hop as an art and as a cross-cultural entity. And because of that, my question to you is, um, what song would you dedicate to the people who disregard and disrespect hip hop as a re revolutionization of hip hop in the classroom? Wow. One song. One song. <laughs> one song. You know, that's actually easy for me. Um, Rakim has a song called Follow the Leader. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Greg Tate, you know, when, when Greg Tate was doing his weekly stuff for the Village Voice, he did this column called Diary of a Buck. And it was just 17 little snippets of stuff that he felt the need to just mention. Yeah, that was so and, and, and he talks about Rakim, am I essential or am I essentialist? Right, you know, and, and, and literally he took Rakim and in Greg Tate's little 17 word piece opened up postmodern theory for him, right? And, uh, am I eternal or, or am I an eternal list? And it was like, wow. Right, so, and so I always go back to that for me and just talking about the complexity of hip hop. Uh, I mean, you could listen to anything but rock by Rock Kim, but follow the leader for me would, would be the one. And you, sir? Uh, wow, that, that's a good one. That's a really good one. I, don't, I don't know, I think Get By um, uh -huh. by Lee because, because it, it actually, Quali's um, Get By for me is still one of the best songs that's ever been written. In any, in any musical genre, in, in the poetry, in any kind of poetic form. And Nina Simone on the piano. Yeah, I mean, yeah and the way it got cut up, you know, by Kanye and all that kind of stuff. But, but um, for me, it's it's basically getting in there and inhabiting all the contradictions um, all at once, you know. It's sort of like, I'm trying to get right, but I know I'm real wrong, you know. But we're, we, we do this, you know, basically, we, we try to get by, you know what I mean? And, if, if you can't have compassion after you listen to that song, yeah. then, yeah. then, you know, your, your soul is, is just is gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just,